So God bless you for being here this evening. If you will, take the Bible there in front of you, unless you are using another Bible that you want to use. Uh, I'm on page 937. 937. And one of the reasons I'm using the ESV on Sunday night and Wednesday night is just so that most all of us will have the very same translation since there are so many translations that people use. And uh, if you will remember, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's had a dream and uh, he's looking for somebody who can interpret that dream. And all of the wise people in the kingdom, the astrologers, the soothsayers, the, all, all of those people, uh, they were hoping that he would tell them his dream. He does not. He uh, lets them know that um, if they can't not only tell him the dream, but the interpretation as well, if they can't do that, he's going to um, saw them in pieces and have them all uh, killed because of that, because then he will know they truly are fakes. He thinks if he gives them the dream, then uh, they can come up with an interpretation and he won't know whether that's what the interpretation is or not. But if they have to determine the dream as well as the interpretation, it's a whole different story. You'll remember Arioch is the one, he's the one chief in command. Nebuchadnezzar um, orders him to go out and to have the, all the wise men slain. And you will remember that Daniel, he steps forward, he goes to the king and uh, lets him know if he will just give a little time that he will not only tell him his dream, but he will give the interpretation of that dream. Now, you got to realize if you're Arioch and you're the one chief in command, that he must have had a lot of trustworthiness. He must have believed big time in Daniel because his uh, head would be on the line for staying the execution uh, until Daniel can get something accomplished here. So we come to verse 19 for tonight in chapter 2. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Now, before we go any further in those verses, let me just say, before this capability of being able to tell Nebuchadnezzar what he dreamed and what this interpretation was, Daniel goes to his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He tells them what the situation is that they need to pray. Uh, tonight, Ken led us in sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer that calls me from a world of care. I don't know about you, but I have learned down through the years in my Christian walk with the Lord that sometimes when you just go to prayer, there's something about all of the situations of life and the crisis of life and everything that's happening in your life, uh, it just sort of somewhat uh, brings some dissipation of the stress and the anxiety that uh, you are feeling. I met one of my former students today uh, in a hospital. I was coming down the hall and uh, he was sharing with me. He said, you know, man, I had been to the doctor three times. It seems like everything's going wrong. And uh, in the midst of that, that, I just said, tie knot and hang on. That's the way it's going to be. And uh, I took his hand. We prayed right there in the hall of the hospital. Prayer is the key, I believe, that unlocks the doors of heaven. I believe that prayer is, as we looked at a few weeks ago, how that the sovereignty of God, him being in control, and yet God rules the world through the prayers of his people. That you and I become instruments through which God will carry out his plans and purposes in this world. And that's why prayer is so vitally important. We seem to try everything before we ever reach out to prayer. But Daniel does the right thing. He does it at the right time. He does it in the right way. Prayer, I believe, accomplishes much. And Daniel is certainly a person in Scripture who had a great 
prayer life. Later, because of his much praying, later on in the book of Daniel, his enemies will conspire to have him put into the lion's den because he was such a prayer person, a prayer warrior. I'm convinced tonight that many of the most important people in all of the world are not the people that are seen. They're not the people that stand before congregations and in great uh, areas uh, where the masses of the people are, but I believe some of the greatest people in all the world are people who are humble and are prayer warriors. I think prayer warriors are uh, some of the greatest people in all of life, and some people have given themselves to a life of prayer where they realize that they are an instrument in the hand of God to bring about his will and his purposes in life. Opposition is always going to be present when we try to pray. Have you ever tried to pray and all of a sudden your mind began to wander? You begin to think about everything in the world except what you're praying about. Any of y'all ever done that? Uh, some of you, you are doing that right now. <laughs> you know how I know? Because I've sat where you're sitting. And I know humanity all too well. Um, I've seen preachers get upset and all of that kind of stuff. And I learned a long time ago, you know, you, that's, that's not the better way to approach things. Uh, I, I'm not sitting where someone's sitting tonight knowing what they're experiencing right now. A lot of people come and they sit in a pew and their hearts are broken or their hearts are being challenged or something is taking place in their life. It's a great crisis. And sometimes it's hard to smile when you're doing that in it. And so prayer, opposition is going to always be there because prayer, because I believe the devil wouldn't oppose us so much if prayer wasn't important. And so the opposition of the devil is always going to be around. He'll always use his demons. He'll always use someone to interrupt our prayer thought. And to be able to receive this capability to recall and interpret the dream, notice it didn't come until in verse 19, then the mystery, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. I read this past week where God is using all kinds of visions and dreams, bringing many out of the uh, Islamic religion into Christianity. How that God is used in a great and mighty way. And one of, one of the articles that I read was speaking about how important it is for you and me to pray that God will use these things as an instrument to bring these people to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe God can do anything, don't you? I believe God can do anything that does not go against his nature. And God is all-powerful. He's omnipotent. And God is omniscient. He's all-knowing. And God is omnipresent. He's there in the second world country tonight. He's there in the third world countries tonight. He's there in the remotest parts of the jungles of Africa tonight. He's present with you and me tonight. I believe one of the greatest failures of the Christian and of the church is the failure to pray incessantly, continuously with the prayer in our hearts for the peoples of the world that are lost without Christ, that we would pray, that we would intercede on their behalf, that uh, the Holy Spirit of the living God would move in their hearts and bring them to a place of conviction and to a place of confession and to a place of conversion. Let me tell you, God is using dreams and visions uh, to bring many people in those areas of life to a saving knowledge of the Lord and Savior. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. And then notice what Daniel does the very next thing. You see, that vision, that interpretation, that dream did not come to him. That capability to be able to do it did not come until a night vision. It required patience to wait for the answer. How many of you tonight are waiting for answers to some of your prayers? Anybody? 
waiting for answers out there, praying continuously. We like answers to our prayers to come before we get done praying, don't we? I mean, we live in such a microwave, instant world, you know, at the uh, click of a mouse on the computer, to our cell phones, the click of a button, uh, to uh, instant everything. We just, because we're so conditioned, we're so conditioned that to get anything instantaneously, that whenever we pray, we pray expecting the answer to be given before right now, before we even finish the prayer. And so oftentimes, uh, the answer comes through patience and through waiting. Hebrews chapter 10, 36, and Martha, don't worry about these. She doesn't have these scriptures. Uh, Hebrews 10, 36 says, if you have need of patience, that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. Patience will test your dedication, it will test your spiritual stamina. And then I want you to notice what happens there in that verse. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Now right now what we're going to see in these next verses is thanksgiving. We see thanksgiving in Daniel's prayer. He immediately, immediately begins to thank God for this revelation I believe that delinquency in thanksgiving is dishonoring to God. And I think it will hinder the answer many times to our prayers in life. Uh, delinquency, thanksgiving. One of the things, thanksgiving was hugely important in the life of Daniel. For the answer takes up much more space here in Scripture than his request did. And so often, we take up more space with our request and little time do we give thanking God at its best. Let's look at how he honors God in this doxology of praise that he gives. Daniel answered and said, verse 20, Blessed be the name of God forever." And ever to whom belong wisdom and might. Notice how he honors God. He says that God is worthy of honor forever and ever. But unfortunately, tonight, the world that you and I live in is not very interested in honoring God in any way, form, or fashion. So he blesses the name of God forever and ever. He gives honor to him to whom belong wisdom and might. And then, verse 21, interesting, he speaks here. Uh, uh, thirdly, about God's power. He spoke about God's honor and God's wisdom there. Notice in verse 21, he changes times and seasons. I wish all these people on climate change would read that. Hello, are y'all out there? Let me tell you, God controls the universe. He controls the weather. He controls the seasons and the times. Barnes, in his commentary, says times and seasons are not under the control of chance, but are bounded by established laws. And yet God, who appointed these laws, has power to change them. This face of God determining and controlling the seasons of our earth will not delight the evolutionist, but after all, nothing is going to delight the evolutionist about God. He changes times and seasons. Any of y'all ever noticed how the times and the seasons have changed through the years? Do you remember when you were a kid, the tornado season usually was in the what? Spring of the year, wasn't it? We didn't have them throughout the summer and the fall and the winter and all of that. Right here, he changes times and seasons. But notice something else that he does. Uh, but God is the judge here. Notice that his authority rules supreme. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings. And sets up kings. 
He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. Notice his authority here. He removes kings. He sets up kings. God uses human instruments in order to accomplish his work. And behind the scene is the divine providence of God. Let me say it again. Let me reiterate it again. From a few weeks ago, God is sovereign. He's in control. Man has human responsibility and one of our human responsibilities is through prayer it's to do uh, prayer to intercede to make supplication because God rules the world through the prayers of his people the psalmist said in the 75th psalm verse 6 and 7 promotion cometh neither from the east nor from the west nor from the south, but God is the judge. He putteth down one and setteth up another. Now, it's really interesting, the Democrats and the Republicans and the Independents and the kings and the queens of the earth around the world, they all think they got to the place they got to because of their particular party or their particular this or that. I can assure you tonight, whoever is in office, trust me, God has a reason. God raises up kings, God sets them down. That's what the scripture says. Notice another thing here in this blessing. He speaks in verse 22 on these bestowments. Notice he gives wisdom unto the wise there in that verse we just read, in knowledge to them that know understanding. Where do you and I get our abilities and our talents? We get them from God, don't we? He's the giver. He's the one that takes them away. I hear a lot of people say, you know, when I was growing up, God gave me this talent. God gave me that ability, but I didn't use it. And through the years, because I did not use it, I lost the ability to do that like I once could do it. I've heard jillions of people throughout the years make that comment, make that statement whether it was in music or singing ability or whether it was in leadership ability or teaching ability or preaching ability or or whatever the ability was, the God-given gifts and talents that they were uh, setting on a shelf and God is the one who enhances those. God is the one that can take those away. And so it's God who gives us those things. Notice he says, In verse 22, the revelation here, he reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what's in the darkness and the light dwells with him. God is omniscient. God is all-knowing. He can turn the light on in every situation that's darkened. God is the God of light. Nebuchadnezzar's uh, wise men, they walked in darkness because they could not know how to interpret a dream because they prayed to the gods of the earth. They didn't pray to the God of heaven that Daniel knew. The apostle John said, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So we see the receiving of this capability and Daniel immediately goes to God in prayer. Notice what he says in verse 23, to you, O God of my father's I love that song, we sing God of our fathers, whose almighty hand. Uh, Notice he says, to you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise. Now, Daniel's message is to the God of praise. I give thanks and praise for you have given me wisdom and might. Right there is where a lot of people miss the boat. It's God and God alone that gives. And notice what Daniel does. Daniel will be different than Arioch, the one who's in charge. Daniel, in humility, he acknowledges, for you have given me wisdom and might. Notice wisdom to know how to use the knowledge. And my, you've given me the power, you've given me the ability, you've enabled me with these bestowments. 
Notice what he says, for you have given me wisdom and might and have now made known to me what we, notice Daniel gives credence to the three friends. He says, what we ask of you, for you have made known to us the king's matter. Notice he gave credit where credit was due. It wasn't just him that was praying. It was these three friends. And notice he's very quick to acknowledge God. God, I give you the praise for the healing out there. People that are praying for people to be healed. When God works through earthly physicians, God works through earthly surgeons and researchers and geneticists and all of these people. God, it's God who gives them the wisdom, who gives them the knowledge, who gives them the ability, who enables them. And so Daniel, in this great doxology of praise, he immediately goes to God in prayer, and then he immediately begins to give this doxology of praise, of thanking God for all of these things. Verse 24 leads us into Daniel's message to Arioch, to this one under Nebuchadnezzar, who is supposed to go out and have these wise men all slain because they are fakes. Daniel has a message to Arioch, two things. There's a precept here. Notice he says in verse 24, Therefore Daniel went into Arioch whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. Now notice Daniel went and said thus to Arioch, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show the king the interpretation. There are two things there that Daniel has as a message to Arioch. Number one is a precept. And that precept is this, destroy not the wise men of Babylon, bring me in before the king. And then here's the second thing, not only the precept, don't destroy these men, bring me in to the king. And the second is a promise, I will show the king the interpretation. Now, I want to say something here that I think is a great life application for you and for me. Number one, we ought to think before we speak. We ought to pray and know before we say. Does that make sense tonight? I mean, haven't you had somebody to walk up to you? Now, I'm not saying that God doesn't use people in order to send a message to us sometimes. Sometimes he does. If you'll remember, Throughout the Old Testament, you see where God is using messengers and God is using prophets. But let me tell you, you've got to be able to spiritually discern what is of the Lord and what's not of the Lord. Uh, You know, a lot of people can say, well, the Lord told me. Well, okay. If he did, let's see if that comes to pass. If that doesn't come to pass, the Lord didn't tell you. You know, you had too much uh, barbecue last night. Uh, You know, uh, something happened on the way to the bed. So, uh, you know, we need to be cautiously aware of what we think. I want you to know that Daniel and these friends, I I mean, they've gone earnestly to God in prayer. It wasn't just something that, that they said over the teeth and over the gums, look out, stomach, here it comes, amen. No, what they did, they bathed this situation in prayer. You know why? It was a life and death situation. Hey, we're going to be slain along with these other wise men of Babylon unless God and God alone gives us the message. So we've got to be serious. We've got to be earnestly praying fervently, effectually about this situation. So oftentimes we never get serious with God in our lives when we're looking for answers until we are absolutely flat on our faces and we have nowhere else to turn. Is that not true, church? Isn't that the way we do that oftentimes? That isn't the way Daniel operated. He immediately, he goes with incredible boldness. He goes with incredible confidence 
to know that, hey, I'm putting myself out here on the line, but I'm going to go in to the king. And folks, let me tell you, to go in and stand before the king like Esther did, it took incredible courage. It took incredible boldness. It took incredible confidence because if the king did not receive you, you were as good as dead. Now, I want you to know when Daniel says in verse 24, there's a lot there. Daniel went in to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus to him, do not destroy. I want you to think about if you're Arioch. And the king has told you, this is your job. The king was already angry, you'll remember. He's already had incredible wrath over this situation because his group, of which Daniel at the time, he and his three friends weren't among that group. That first group that uh, thought that they were going to pass something over on Nebuchadnezzar, and they didn't include Daniel and his friends, obviously because they were the ones that wanted all the gifts that the king was going to bestow on them. If they could give the answer, little did they realize that when they went before the king, the king was going to give an ultimatum. I, I don't want you just to interpret my dream. I want you to tell me what I dreamed. It seems that Nebuchadnezzar really had not forgotten the dream. Most commentators believe, based upon uh, the literature there, that he was putting to test those uh, that were among his supposedly people that could tell him future events. And so, if you'll remember, Daniel and his friends, they're not there at the onslaught of this. They don't want Daniel to have any credit for anything. And so they go, and then they realize, hey, they're up against something that, that is far beyond a challenge they can do. In fact, they've said, you know, there's not anybody on earth that can do this, if you'll remember, over there in chapter 2 from last week. So Daniel says, do not destroy the wise men of Babylon while Arioch is in a position. Do I listen to this cat? Or do I do what the king told me to do? Now, you've got a situation there where Arioch and Daniel, there, there's something going on here, and I think that something that's going on here is called the providence of a sovereign God behind the scenes working in Arioch as well as working in the life of Daniel because Daniel makes these incredible acclaims. Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king. See, Arioch probably has forgotten. Daniel had already been before the king uh, and said, if you'll give me a little bit of time, I will not only tell you your dream, but I will interpret that dream. And then Daniel gives this incredible promise, and I will show the king the interpretation. One of the things that I see there that has to be for me, is the fact that Daniel was confident beyond any question whatsoever that he had immediately sought the Lord in prayer and thanksgiving ahead of time. Let me ask you a question when you pray and you're really concerned about something that's going on in your life, with your children, with your grandchildren, with the job, with your finances, with your health. When you go to God in prayer, do you first of all say, God, I want to thank you in advance that I know whatever befalls me, you do all things well. That's not the way most of us pray, is it? We go to God in prayer and say, oh God, please. Oh, God, please. Daniel, obviously, obviously saw the providence and the sovereignty of Almighty God in this situation. Therefore, he could stand and proclaim without a shadow of a doubt that God was going to do this thing. Verse 25, then Arioch, brought in Daniel before the king in haste 
Notice he's in a hurry. I mean, Ariok, you know, he's already hanging out there in the balances at this point. And said thus to him, notice what Ariok does here versus what Daniel did up there when he thanked God for his friends that God had heard them. Daniel gives all the glory and the praise to God about the interpretation and the dream. But look what Arioch does. I've found among the exiles from Judah a man who will make known to the king the interpretation. You think, oh, Arioch is looking for a special uh, attaboy? He, he, he's obviously looking here rather than coming in in all humility and saying, Daniel's God has given answer to his supplications. Therefore, O king, listen to this one. I've had nothing to do with this. The hand of God is all over it. That isn't what Arioch does. He wants the praise, obviously. He wants the, you know, people want praise and glory. Hello. America's full of it. The praise and the glory. Notice verse 26. The king declared to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar. Remember, he, that's another name Daniel's given. Are you able to make known to me the dream that I have seen and its interpretation? Notice verse 27. Daniel answered the king and said, No wise man, men, enchanters, Magicians or astrologers can show to the king the mystery that the king has asked. Now notice how he prefaces the king's asking him a question. Down there in verse 26, are you able? Ken, I love that old song we used to sing in the blue Baptist hymnal. Are you able, said the master. Are you able? The king looks at Daniel. I want you to think about how frightening this situation could be. Are you able to make known to me the dream that I've seen and its interpretation? And notice Daniel answers the king, no wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show to the king the mystery that the king has asked, but... There is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. Folks, tonight, a life application for you and me to take away is this. There is a God in heaven tonight. He watches over this world. Nothing is going to happen that isn't first sifted through his hands. And then if it's allowed... It will be because he has a reason and a purpose for what he allows. There is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. I want you to notice the witness that Daniel gives right here to the king of a pagan nation. Remember, he's been away from his homeland in Jerusalem for quite some time now. But he has not forgot the God of his childhood. I remember that song. I love that song, Ken. I have returned to the God of my childhood. Do you remember the God of your childhood? There is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. And he, once again, Daniel is giving God the praise and the glory. He has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Now, the latter days there is going to refer to the world history of the Gentile nations. And that is going to lead us, when we get a little further into our study in the book of Daniel, of the Gentile nations 
in the history of the world before the great time when the Antichrist is going to come on the scene. But there is a God in heaven. God and God alone. There used to be a song out, God and God alone. Who reveals mysteries? Let me tell you, it's the Holy Spirit of the living God who reveals to you and to me what Holy Writ means, what the Scripture means. The problem is so often we're in such a hurry that we read over it and we miss it. There is a God in heaven. He reveals mysteries. Hey, he can even use dreams and visions out there to bring people to a saving knowledge as he's doing there in the Islamic world. And he, Daniel, very quickly gives God the praise and the glory and the adoration and the exaltation here in his doxology of praise. He's giving thanksgiving away ahead of time before he stands before the king. And he's going to tell Nebuchadnezzar what will be notice in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head as you lay in bed are these. To you, O king, as you lay in bed came thoughts of what would be after this. And he who reveals mysteries made known to you what is to be. But as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me. Notice that Daniel takes absolutely no credit whatsoever. And folks, let me tell you, that's just like this church. May 10 will be 20 years old. It all has to do with God. It's not me. It's not us. It's him. Notice Daniel says, but as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because of any wisdom that I have more than all the living, but in order that the interpretation may be made known to the king and that you may know the thoughts of your mind. God will use Daniel for such a time as this because Daniel is a tool in the potter's hand to bring a message to an earthly pagan king of a pagan nation of what is coming down the pike in human world history. Isn't it absolutely amazing? And I think one of the greatest life applications for you and me to take away from this is Daniel not only received the capability from God and gave God the glory for it all, but he reported this capability and once again he said, it's not me. It's not of me. And then he reaffirms this capability. And we're going to pick this up next Wednesday night and we're going to see what this dream is all about that will deal with the Gentile nations of the world. And as I mentioned to you earlier, it's going to speak about Babylon, the head of gold, on this colossus dream, this figure that he sees, a head of gold, which will rap represent the Babylonian kingdom of the earth at that time. But the breast and the arms of silver are going to represent another nation that will come after the Babylonian, the Medes and the Persian kingdom that will overtake Babylon. And that will be followed by another kingdom that we're going to look at in this colossal figure, 
which will be the Grecian kingdom, the kingdom of the Greeks, which will be followed by legs of iron, which will be the Roman Empire. And then the ten toes that are made of clay and iron will represent a ten league federation of nations of the revived Roman Empire that is coming one of these days when the Antichrist assumes his role in the world and the world will be ruled by these ten kings or these ten leaders of these uh, league of nations that will be overtaken in the end by a kingdom that will be forever and ever and ever and ever, and that will be thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When you and I pray that model prayer every Sunday morning, we're praying for his kingdom to come. And that's what we're going to see in the rest of this book of Daniel as we continue to see it unfold in the latter chapters of this book. And so this dream that Nebuchadnezzar has had, it's of this great statue that represents the kingdom of Babylon, the kingdoms of the Medes, Persians, the kingdoms of the Greeks, the kingdom of the Roman Empire, the Holy Roman Empire. And, of course, the Holy Roman Empire uh, didn't vanish, but it dissipated and will be revived by the ten toes that are on this colossal figure that Nebuchadnezzar sees of the revived Roman Empire in end time events. The Bible is absolutely a fascinating book of truth. And let me tell you, whenever you and I study it, in the depth, in the context, and look at these verse by verse, I can assure you, you can see in the days ahead where we are in the present world today. And to see that this is referring, his dream will be about the Gentile nations of the world that will end in human history and the setting up of God's millennial kingdom one of these days on the face of this earth. Let me tell you, it's fascinating to know that God is sovereignly in control and he will use human instrumentation to bring about his purposes and will for this world. Amen. God bless you for being here tonight. Would you stand? We're not going to have an invitation tonight, but uh, thank you for being here. God bless you. Be safe going home and hope to see you back on Sunday morning, Palm Sunday. We will be baptizing Wes uh, at the beginning of the service. Uh, Amber Griffey will be being baptized, and so be sure and remember that our deacon body. Uh, Keith will lead us, uh, he and our deacon body, as we observe the Lord's Supper. We'll have the message first and observe the Lord's Supper at the very end. So uh, be sure and remember this is Palm Sunday that uh, we observe when Jesus rode and made his triumphant entry into the city of Jerusalem for Passion Week. Passover week that would culminate in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. God bless you for being here tonight. Would you bow with me? Say with me, if you will, the model prayer tonight as we close. Would you do that? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.